stabilization, that is by storing water when it's available and it's wet in normal years, you can then pump it out when you have dry years like this year when the allocation is particularly low in the state water price. <coughs> now, in addition to providing, well, the supply from the east side water bank is substituted for production from the east side water treatment plant. And that's about a 5,000 acre foot per year delivery currently. And you can also produce additional supply that can be pumped back to the East Branch. So you get the flexibility to supplement or replace the production from the East Side plant or to produce raw water and put it back up into the East Branch. Now, because it's a supply of low TOC or total organic carbon source water, it will have a lower production of THMs than the state project water will tend to. And when the state water project is poor, you can substitute groundwater and help yourself help. The pipeline is proposed to come off an existing train up on the East Branch, uh, run water down 196th Street to East mm -hmm. Avenue U and over to the 80 acre property that that was purchased. And at that location is where we propose the three recharge basins and four wells. And the well production will pump into a pipeline that will then travel two miles to the existing east side treatment plant and can be pumped directly into the clear well at that plant. And so to show you some of the site facilities, I'll zoom in a little bit. But basically there's three miles of 20 to 24 inch pipeline and then all of the work that would go onto the site itself. So this view is now tipped on its side, so north is to the left, or the, you know, the left side of the screen is north. So the three recharge basins in the center are roughly two acres, or just over two acres each. The four wells are somewhere in the corners of the side, if you will. And each one of them has a discharge pipeline and a blow-off pipeline. The blow-offs are collected in the common law pond, which is located <coughs> here, and that will percolate typical blow offs but from the well startup. But if there's a need to pump a well for a prolonged period of time, like a day or more, then this small pond can actually overflow and flow into the larger recharge basin <coughs> and control water flow within the site. You can pump one or two or all of the wells basically continuously in each sample rather before putting those wells into the system with the beneficial feature. At this end of the site, there's a proposed building which is a chlorine and pump station building. I'll show you the detail of what the building floor plan looks like. Next to the building is a small tank supposed to be a 100,000 gallon above ground steel tank, and that's part of the pump back scenario. You have to separate the potable supply from any raw water pipelines, so you would have an air gap that meets California Department of Public Health and pH requirements, and that's a, basically a pumping tank that the pumps in the adjacent building would be able to pump back to the spring. So <coughs> these are the three recharge basins, we talked about the four wells, Pipeline collection on the site, the building, the tank, the off pond. This feature here is the unit structure. It allows the water to be split by operation staff to any one or multiple ones of the basins so they can have one basin in service and two hour service, two basins in service, and one hour service. So the idea is they can rotate the basins for months at a time, have one drying or two drying in the service. It allows them to have uh, the beds that they can dry out and maintain as necessary. So there's a mile and a half of fence, it's a seven foot high chain link fence with three strands of barbed wire. It has multiple locked gates, but it's to make the site entirely secure. In addition to the site being secure because of the fencing, each of the individual four wells is supposed to be put in the building. And that, I'll, I'll show you on the next slide. Let's leave it here. And then the building itself is a secure building that has a system. 
This is a cross section of what the basins look like because they actually staircase someone as they go slightly downhill. This, the site is built from north, from south to north, slopes to the north. So each of the basins is progressively lower than the one above. So the overflow from the first basin can flow to the second, and the second basin can flow to the third. The third, if it overflows, can flow to the natural ravines that's in the northwest corner of the site. Approximately half of the basin is below the current grade. So if you, you draw the current grade, which is this line through the project site from one basin through the next, basically a large portion of the design is in the cut, that is, it's below natural grade. There's some questions about the berm design and the structural integrity of the berms. It's beneficial to point out that a large portion is actually below grade rather than entirely built up. This is a cross section of the middle basin just going in the other direction. What's shown here is a, is a roller park building. And it's two, a two-piece building where half the building stays put and half the building can literally roll apart on rail. And so this left half of the building in this layout remains stationary. This is the electrical one. And there's a door to the outside and a door to the pump room. But the building around the pump room can actually slide on these rails and be completely removed from above the well so the well can be pulled and literally taken apart. It needs to be able to be elevated to do that. So basically, in this particular, it's difficult to see, but I'm going to, this outline, this rectangle, is the half of the building that's rolled apart. And that building rolls back and locks into place. So each of the well sites is secure and have you know, noise dampening because of the, the structures themselves. Lastly, I want to show you the uh, layout, proposed layout for the chlorine and pump station building. These half, or the right half on this diagram, is a chlorine building that's very much similar actually a duplication of the chlorine building that you have at the WS62 project that's currently been completed in our line. And the same as the chlorine building used at 80th and 8th, 80th and H, and at, I believe, Mojave as well. So it's a standard chlorine room, and it, the tanks that hold by bulk bleach, if you will, it's sodium hydrochloride chloride delivered at 12 and percent. These tanks are within double wall containment. So this containment is designed in size to hold um, one the breach of one full tank within the area. And there's an alarm system. There's a lead, there's an eyewash shower on the inside, there's an eyewash shower on the outside. There's plenty of monitors and control system. All of these things are, are monitored then and tied into your telemetry SCADA system. SCADA being supervisory control and data acquisition. So your, your information will be sent through a radio link to the east side treatment plant and tied into your SCADA system, which also is controlled and reviewed from here. In this location, staff 24 7. So you always have observation of all of your operating sites, including this one. So any leakage, any intrusion alarms, any failures of the systems would be immediately reported. The left half of this building uh, proposed to have three vertical turbine pumps. Um, with a two plus one configuration, where one pump is a half flow and the second pump is full flow, for pumping back to the east branch, as I mentioned a bit earlier. And this is simply an electrical room to support that pump station in the building. So those are, that is an outline of the, the current facilities and proposals for the project. This shows the current schedule, and we're currently right here at the dock of mitigated Lake deck on you know, May 13th. Um, we currently have well drilling bid opening, a well drilling bid opening for the four wells for the actual drilling of the wells, not the equipment, um, right now on May 15th. So basically in 36 hours or whatever, do the math, it's Thursday morning, people will be opening bids in this room. So it's a fairly aggressive schedule, which is why we're out to bid at the same time. We're working through this secret process. Once the sequel is adopted, then well drilling bids can be awarded and the rest of the project design can be completed and then constructed. So the north end of the basin is clear the area that's been designated based upon field service from field assistance. Um, there's no other significant impacts that have been found during the study and then um, 
We're here tonight to review the results and any comments. First, I want to update you, though, because as I mentioned, the last few months, there are ongoing biology surveys, because these biology surveys need to be done in the, in the spring and into early summer. And there's three species that have been determined to be um, significant or sensitive. What's the right term? Uh, they are sensitive. Um, there's a <coughs> high potential for them to occur on site. Right. We talked through this about there's maps that show areas for which these species have been found previously. And so we've got the desert tortoise, the Mojave Browns squirrel, and the Boeing owl. And some of these require multiple surveys, and these surveys have to be um, sort of time periods apart from one another. So basically, the desert tortoise survey has been done, it's been completed, and it was negative and not found. The Mojave Browns squirrel has a very complex grid system of night trappings. Um, this is where some of your money is being spent because it's tedious. Two of those three surveys have completed, been completed and they're also negative. And there's one more survey that's to be completed but it cannot be done before June 15th. So um, your person will be out there June 15th for five nights doing the final trapping grids so we can clear the site finally by June 20th. And then have a notice to proceed for the well building for June 23rd if all goes well. So at this point, We're doing fine, but we have one more survey from Mojave Ground Squirrel in June. We have two more surveys for drawing out, and that's the summary of the, the biology of the surveys that we've been working on. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife, from um, one of the customers within your service area, um, the name is on the end of the letter, Randall Scott, who's in the audience tonight, and the third letter was received from the Houghton. Regional Water Quality Control Board. Each of these letters and our response to these letters are in the packets. And so uh, the adoption. Uh, I wanted to uh, actually commend the agency <coughs> for continuing to look for land in areas out the, in the Emerald Valley that will support water banking. And also, in this particular case, doing the, the correct analysis and everything before buying the property. And I think this is a good project. Uh, I think it should go forward. I think uh, mitigating negative debt was the correct vehicle to use. I thought it was well done. I did have some comments that I submitted, and uh, the folks uh, before the meeting started tonight uh, gave me a, a copy of the responses. I appreciate them taking the time to respond, and I'm satisfied with all the responses. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, they're doing a great job of working with us to make sure that we make it through the summer. So on behalf of Valley County Water Works, just thanks for figuring out how we together and commendations to your staff. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to give you the, uh, everybody an update uh, where we're at the uh, conceptual design for the uh, operations center expansion. So we came up with two options, putting a driveway into the north, tying into the existing drive aisle, uh, or an uh, option of a driveway to the east, tying into the main entrance coming up. Um, let me go forward here real quick and show you the two different options. This is a site plan. This is the, this is the drive aisle. This is the, the parking coming in from the north, which would be over here. And, uh, and uh, so let me go back a couple of slides. Um, advantages is the access is, is, is not from a busy drive aisle. That's actually just the plant access. You have uh, maintenance and, and occasional truck deliveries coming out of that area. Um, Visibility is not a concern. We've got good visibility coming in and out of that driveway. Disadvantages for that driveway would be there's an increase in the slope of the existing access drive aisle where those trucks would come out. Um, we would increase that slope in that area. Uh, it requires reconstruction of the existing drive aisle, and it would require a small retaining wall. Um, it shows the retaining wall that we show would be right in this area here. Just to get our elevations and grades to work, we have a small retaining wall right there. Uh, not, not a significant feature. It would be a small retaining wall there. Um, but, but, and, then, and then the slopes that would increase were, is up in here. As we tear this drive aisle out, we'd have to tilt it and, and make it much steeper as it comes through there. Not necessarily that bad, if you notice right in the center, uh, of this intersection right here, we have an existing slope that's about six and a half percent now. 
So if you increase that cross slope to 5% in the other areas, it's not that significant if you look at that existing intersection um, as it tilts there. And so um, that's, that's this driveway here. Now as we go forward, um, the driveway to the east, and I'll, I'll go ahead and go forward to this, this site plan. Here is the driveway to the east. This is a, a, the new configuration where we're actually coming in, coming off, off of uh, the <coughs> main entrance to the site. Um, and, and, and the advantages of this one is we actually get a, an additional two parking spaces in that area. Um, it does not require that we tear out and reconstruct the existing drive aisle. Uh, disadvantages, there is a, a retaining wall required. I'll point that out in a minute. And uh, the two drive aisles enter at the main aisle in pro close proximity to each other. Um, so to point that area out, we've got, this is a, yeah, the small retaining wall in that area. And then we've got this drive aisle and this drive aisle entering into the main at, at the area at the same location. I don't know how much of a disadvantage that really is from the standpoint you've only got a few cars parking in here, you don't have a lot of traffic. How often do you have people coming and going from the lab? Because basically that's who's going to park down here, it is, is customers of the lab. Um, so, you know, I don't see a large traffic conflict, but if there is, there is a little bit of a concern there that those driveways are so close to each other, especially with the main drive all coming up and out of it. We've added them in the upper parking lot to create a solar panel carport situation, covered parking on the upper parking lot. Um, we've added a breeze on the new building roof. Um, so we've added them everywhere that we feel that is practical, that you can get some kind of efficiency out of the panel. Um, the, a couple of potential solar firms that are doing a lot of work around here are SOMAS, um, FMC, I think it's FMC, but it's SOMAS and Solar City. There's obviously other solar firms that we can contact, um, and, and we, pro we probably will um, start that process here before too long, starting to make some contact, get some information, and bring that information to the committee to, to kind of start working with the, with the solar aspects of what, how we might incorporate that into this project. Are these the people that uh, do the cities and stuff like that? SOMAS FMC is doing the city of Palmdale parking lots in their, in their parking lot right now that's under construction if you've been there recently. There's a proposal that we've been on in the proposal that we've been on. Yeah, that's a pretty good plan, I think. Yeah, and in Solar City is the one that works with the city of Lancaster. The existing building, uh, the upper parking lot, and the new building, as well as the new uh, connecting breezeway. These are areas that we've identified as having the highest potential uh, for efficient use of solar energy. Um, we could do the same thing in the lower <coughs> parking lot or, the, or even the employee parking lot. Um, the, employee, the guest parking lot does not really, there's not enough parking area there to really do that too. I don't know that that's really efficient use. The employee parking area probably could use it. We could probably add that to the employee parking area uh, for the new building. This is a new elevation showing the solar panels. This is, uh, you can see the solar panels on the existing building here, and we've, and we've added a new breezeway connection from the existing building to the new building. Um, and, and we've shown that covered with uh, solar panels. Um, we we'll have to do a little bit of research and see how we, we'd like to make that water tight so we don't have dripping water between the panels. And I, I, they're, they're doing this a lot anymore. There's not much water penetration as it is now in some of these installations, but I, I think we could probably, you know, with some gaskets or something, make the installation such that you don't have water dripping in, you know, in between the, the panels above without having to actually build a roof and then set it on top of it. We could do that too, but we're, but we're, we're looking to that. Um, but this is our concept for the breezeway connection. Um, there's a new feature here also is a covered area above the existing entrance. That's this area. In this area right here, we, we've at, in order to make this so that you have covered walkway from, from completely covered walkway from both buildings, we've had to add this covered uh, area in front of the existing building. And we propose to make that area glass so that we would not 
so that we would still maintain the same light levels. We want to maintain light levels with them that come through the front, front doors there and so forth, so we would make this covered area out of glass. Uh, we think it would be a, an attractive feature and provide the protection from the elements uh, that's desired. And then that would connect right into the breezeway going across to the other building. Once you get to the other building, we have a covered area out front of that entrance as well. So, so you know, the thought is maybe you could walk from building to building without getting wet if it's raining out. I know it doesn't rain much, but it is something to consider. We've also, if you've noticed that the elevations, um, we've actually added the texture of the block. We've added some, some uh, bands across that will be block. Um, a little more realistic coloring and textures to, to the elevations now than we previously had. You know, we're, each time we look at this model, we refine it a little bit more. Um, so that's what our west elevation looks like now. Um, and then the, the, other, the other, what we talked about was the, the breezeway connected between the buildings. We already talked about, we added the glass covered entry canopy at the existing building. Um, and because the glass will maintain the existing light levels, and then we added that breezeway connection uh, and put solar panels on, on, on that, for that roof for that structure. And, and that again, uh, if you back up to that slide, um, that's the, the canopy and the connection there in the front. Um, you know, if we didn't put solar panels on the breezeway, we would recommend that also be done in glass. So that, that um, we feel that that would probably, you know, that way we're not hiding the building behind it uh, with a roof structure at that location. Um, we just built, and that would also match the glass that we'd be putting at the front entrance. So windows on this, if there was, if the awnings, the shades over the windows, um, you can't really tell from this angle, but those do extend beyond the windows a couple of feet on both sides. Um, the next slide showed, showed the west elevation that we have enhanced. Uh, with a, with a uh, canopy on the lower end, and, and then this is a, another view uh, from the basically of the employee parking lot from that uh, west side of the building, um, with, with the columns and the canopy that we have now incorporated into the into that model. Um, this is basically uh, the floor plans. We hadn't removed this from before. I just I, I left this slide in there just to to show the floor plans of the building and what we're proposing. Um, we haven't made any changes to this. This is the same that we've all looked at uh, previously. And, and, that, and, then, and then the next thing I wanted to get into is, is LEED certification. We talked about that last time. Um, this project would fall under the LEED uh, building design and construction accredi accreditation category. Um, this process and, and through the Green Building Certification Institute and their fees are approximately, as you can see, they're basically about $4,000. Um, consultant estimated fees would be somewhere in the neighborhood of about $25,000 to, uh, for the application, the documentation, commissioning, and energy modeling that would be required to be, uh, to, for the submittal that would go to the Green Building Certification Institute for them to review and, and <coughs> analyze and, and, then, and then provide the certification that we'd be applying for. Um, mm -hmm. The cost of construction associated with LEED certification is dependent on the level of certification that we get, and that would vary anywhere from about 3% to about 15% of the total construction cost, depending on how far we go with the LEED certification. And platinum would be 80 points plus. Um, Platinum would be extremely difficult to obtain. Uh, gold may be difficult to obtain. We don't, we don't know. Um, these are the categories that you have that, that provide points. Um, sustainable sites. Uh, you know, this site is not really high as far as sustainable sites might be concerned, but we might get a couple of points out of it based on some of the stuff that we're doing with the site. Um, solar, solar would give us points. So that would come into this category. Energy and atmosphere, um, we can work with that to high efficiency units, um, indoor environmental quality, you know, uh, extra insula insulation, um, you know, those, those give us extra points. Uh, water efficiency, definitely 
low flow, ultra low flow, plumbing fixtures give us more points, uh, materials and resources, you know, are, we, are we building a facility out of recycled materials, if we're doing that, that gives us a lot of points, um, innovation and design, um, maybe we could get a couple of points in that category, uh, regional priority, I don't know that we'd get much points in that category. We have to add, add in a location factor where we're located. There's some additional costs that they, the, the cost books tell us that we need to add into that. We threw 20% contingencies at this yet because we're still so, you know, we're not even in the schematic design yet. We're still in conceptual design stage. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Hitchner. I'm with Nexus Ewater. Uh, Mark Petroff, our CEO, is in the back here today. We are delighted to be here and tell you a little bit about on-site water recycling and why we think this should be something that you as a board and as a water agency think about proactively as you go forward in the future. Here is uh, something that some of you, I know some of you came actually to this house and uh, saw it demonstrated uh, several months ago, it was in late February. Uh, this is a demonstration of one of our very first units in the United States by KB Home in Lancaster. And what we have here is an, a system that, uh, that recycles the water on site for reuse on site. And what we do is we take gray water out of the home and we bring it down to this tank here and then we process it on site in our appliance where we clean it up to basically the levels of Title 22 tertiary disinfected water. It is not considered Title 22 water, but it is a similar quality. And then we place it into storage here. It becomes the, uh, the primary source of water for irrigation and for the toilets in the home, uh, depending on how you wish to use it. And as we show here, uh, in, in this case, this was KB Home's first double zero home. KB Home previously has, has built net zero homes where it's net zero for energy. This was the first time that they built a home where there was no fresh water, no city water was used for irrigation. All of the city water came out of the gray water that was in the home to begin with. And we're able to do that for two reasons. One is because KB Home designed the landscape to be very water efficient and drought tolerant. The other thing is that they recycled this water in the home. The key thing to remember here is that we can take two out of every three gallons of indoor water and use it a second time on site. So it is an incredibly impactful new type of water efficiency. Compared to an existing home in California, this home in, in Lancaster would use about 150,000 gallons less per year. And compared to a new home built to uh, to code, it would use about 75,000 less. Of course, that all depends on what is the size of the landscape. Obviously, this is uh, something that's of great interest now. It's, it's a, a great topical interest. This is an example of the reporting that came out of the home in Lancaster from National Geographic. It also has been featured in KABC and in other mag magazines and online blogs. Now, as I said at the beginning, we are, we're, we are looking at the water energy nexus, not just water, but also energy as well. Uh, and the problem of the water energy nexus is that when we generate electricity, we use water to do so. When we use water, when we bring it from the mountains and we pump it and treat it and heat it, we're again using a lot of energy. Uh, we need a lot of energy to use the water. And in the water energy nexus, the, the largest factor in it is water heating in the home. So that's the other part of our solution is that we have, uh, we are able to address all of the energy that's used in water heating at the same time as we're able to reduce the amount of water that's used in the home. And as you see in our name, we call ourselves the e-water recyclers, and we address the problem at the source in the home. So what is e-water? It's uh, basically energy embedded water, gray water that is in the home. The E in E water stands for energy. 
And what we do is we try to recycle both sides of the e-water, the energy and the water as well. So in your home today, you're bringing in huge supplies of city water. And the biggest use of it goes to the lawn in most cases. And then you have inside the home, you have uh, water that is, is, becomes gray water because it's barely soiled. It's, it's from the showers and from the baths and from uh, your hand sinks and washing. And then you have black water which goes to sewer. Now today, all of this goes to sewer. What we do is we're going to take the gray water portion and we're going to reuse it. So by doing that, we can use, we can reuse 100% of the gray water that's in the home. And we can recycle enough energy to, uh, uh, to heat water for the home. So we're able to reduce the energy input in water heating by 80%. And we reduce the uh, amount of water in the home by uh, the by the two-thirds of the indoor water. So our, our mission is to treat and reuse the e-water on site. We want to recycle the heat, and we want to reuse the water. And I'll show you very briefly how we do this. We call this on-site water recycling. Obviously, from a code perspective, when you talk about recycled water in California, you're talking about water that is brought from the home through the sewage system to the treatment plant, and then it is treated up to the Title 22 standards, and then it is again distributed back out through purple pipes and it's reused. That, in terms of the code, is the official definition of recycled water. We call what we do on-site water recycling, but in the code it has a different name. It is called on-site treated non-potable gray water system. And that's, that's exactly what we do. We are one of these systems. The uh, thing that's really important that I'd like you to know is that this is new in the code. It was not in there until January 1st. So it got there just in time for the drought this year. And for companies like us to begin to bring uh, systems to the market. Uh, we are able, with this water, to use it for all kinds of irrigation. Above ground, below ground, it can be used for vegetables, it can for fruit trees. We can also use it inside the home to flush the toilets. So here's a simple view of how our system works. We bring the gray water down through dedicated pipes. We put it into a collection tank. We process up to 200 gallons per day in our treatment device. And then we again store it underground. We don't take a lot of, of, uh, of home space to do this because these two components are underneath the ground. And then this becomes the primary source of water to irrigation and to toilet flushing. If ever there is not enough gray water in here to take care of all of that, city water is topped up through a special, uh, special valve, an inflow valve, which is separated by a four inch area. Then we're going to be able to recycle and treat two thirds of that water, about 40,000 gallons a year. Uh, we can reuse it and we're going to build a drought tolerant landscape that will be supplied by this. So there's no green portion in here, but there is landscape on the home. And this home is using about 60,000 gallons a year. Certified our system, we're in, in testing right now. When we get certified to the NSF 350 standard, we can go out and sell this process, or sell this system. Uh, Oroville is at 63% historical average, which is a little bit of a drop from last time. And San Luis is 54% uh, of average. Slight increase, but still not very helpful. <coughs> so, um, here's the reservoir conditions. Again, uh, Orville's 52% capacity, 63% of uh, historical average. So you can get a feel for the, the reservoir storage in, uh, in the state. Still extremely low, which means next year is going to start out pretty, uh, pretty dry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Um, and here's the Northern Sierra precipitation, the station index. You can see it's creeped up a little bit, but it's pretty flat, and I wouldn't expect much uh, to happen in the spring. Um, I did look at the 10 day forecast for the, for the river, and there's nothing on the horizon, so no new storms coming. About 12 MGD right now. Um, we've got four new wells that are coming online by the end of the month. So we're at 12 MGD now. We're going to continue to increase our capabilities as we go forward. So are we pumping from five new wells? 
see, we've got, uh, yeah, four plus one, um, and yeah, there'll be an additional uh, three that'll be used full time. That's what we're looking at. So at the end of May, we'll have, how many <coughs> new we'll have a total a total of eight wells running right now. Oh, eight. Total of eight. Excuse me, point six. And we are extracting water, sending three MGD to Mojave, a challenge for us to put the pieces together in this portfolio, but where we are right now, uh, again, we have to stay flexible, but it looks like we will be able to meet our customers' requests this year, um, and it's a combination of, you know, things, and <coughs> things can happen in the future. We've got a little bit of a buffer, but the bottom line is it looks like we're in pretty good shape. Um, we do have a customer workshop. You know, we had one, what was that? It was a, what was it? Was it February? March, March, we had a customer workshop just to let our customers know what's going on with the supply situation. We've got another one that we're scheduling probably for the next couple of weeks out. You know, it's probably 